Sponsored by the ABA section of the Civil Rights and Social Justice, this panel is one of many in a series of rapid response webinars. We are actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues, so please visit AmericanBar.org backslash CRSJ for updates on these programs. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A, not the chat function. If you do not see the controls, please ensure your screen is not idle. We will address questions at the end of the panel. We will be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who has registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. Based on historian John Meacham's bestseller, the 2020 HBO documentary, The Soul of America, explores pivotal historical events when demagoguery, conspiracy theories, and alternative facts spoke the loudest to justify slavery, Jim Crow laws, a culture of white supremacy, the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II, McCarthyism, and other dark chapters of this nation's history. The film recognizes forces of hate and division as recurring themes in American life, but ultimately gives hope that the lessons of the past may bring this nation closer to achieving its democratic ideals. We are at another pivotal moment in history. We remain in a period of social reckoning in which many harbor unfounded stereotypes that cast entire communities of color, immigrants and religious minorities as dangerous threats to our country. Millions of voters continue to believe that the presidential election was stolen despite evidence to the contrary and elected leaders continue to fuel this narrative even after the US Capitol was stormed in a failed insurrection to overturn the elections. This panel will discuss the role that lawyers play in supporting the constitution and the cause of truth and the dire consequences to democracy, fundamental freedoms and the rule of law when they ignore them. So without further ado, we wanna show a clip of Soul of America. We're living in an era of politics as entertainment. Build the wall. We have been here before. 100 years ago, the governor of Georgia wanted to build a wall of steel to keep immigrants out. Huh. What changed everything is Pearl Harbor. The internment that Japanese Americans went through is history now. But what's happening on our southern borders feels like it is current news. What I see going on today is so reminiscent of what I saw in the 60s. The women's movement fought for women to be able to stand up, and that's something we're still fighting for today. We will not be silenced. Fear, anxiety, and violence are inextricably intertwined with the story of the country. We can learn a lot by studying the McCarthy era. Even if there only one communist, but there will be one communist, too many. McCarthy understood that headlines spoke louder than details. He would have loved Twitter. When you see something that is not right, you have to do something. Change in America comes when the powerful take notice of what the people have been saying. It's on all of us to save the country. Well, we are thrilled to bring you today's program entitled Speaking Truth to Power, The Fragility of Democracy and the Role of Attorneys in Upholding the Constitution. What a powerful beginning to our program. I'm Mary Smith. I'm the immediate past secretary of the American Bar Association, and I am vice chair of the Ben Group. I want to introduce our panelists, our, our fabulous panelists. First, we have former Congressman Charlie Dent, he served in the U.S. House of Representatives, representing Pennsylvania's 15th Congressional District for seven terms. During his time in Congress, he served on the House Committee on Appropriations and chaired the House Ethics Committee. He is currently the Executive Director and Vice President of the nonpartisan Aspen Institute's Congressional Program, where he leads bipartisan, bicameral policy education programs for sitting members of Congress. In addition to his role at the Aspen Institute, Congressman Dent is a political commentator for CNN, a senior policy advisor for DALA Piper, 
and a distinguished advisor for Pew Charitable Trust. We also have Dale Manami. He's a senior counsel with the firm Manami Tamaki and is best known for leading the legal team that overturned the conviction of Fred Korematsu, an American of Japanese descent who was arrested for refusing to enter an internment center in 1942. Korematsu's case led to the historic challenge of the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II in the seminal case of Korematsu versus United States. In 2019, Mr. Manami was honored with the ABA medal, the American Bar Association's highest honor, and he was the first Asian American to receive this award in the ABA's history. And finally, we have K.D. Davidson. She is the filmmaker who brought us this powerful movie, The Soul of America, with Coonhart Films and HBO. And on her website, I love this, Katie says, artists can transcend political identities. At our best, we can motivate and inspire, uplift and encourage. That's what I like to do or try to do. And her current projects include a book about changing the world. And um, she is based in New York and she's author of a forthcoming memoir on the Great Recession. So I wanna start with you, KD. What caused you to create The Soul of America and how did the timing of what's happening in the nation affect your editorial choices? Well, um, so I grew up in Texas and uh, in a really incredibly conservative family. And um, that's not how my ideology sort of developed. I, I had some really great teachers in high school and, and I was a, a debate, I was on the debate teams. I actually thought I was gonna be a lawyer. That was my sort of goal. So um, I, I started really getting interested in political science and studied political theory in school. And I decided that I wanted to become a documentary documentarian because I felt like it was a good way to reach across the aisle. I basically have always been trying to figure out a way to talk to my family um, and kind of bridge some political divides that we have. And um, over the last 10 years, I've seen those divides really become um, that much more entrenched. There are, you know, like we basically can't talk about anything that I do, you know, in my, in my life without getting into these heated conversations. And uh, when the opportunity to make this film came up, I was so excited because John Meacham is so particularly good at talking to a bipartisan audience. He has um, a belief system and a way of speaking that really invites people in. And I kind of was making this film in a way to sort of reach my mom. Um, so that kind of, that was my heart space going into the project. And uh, as we started the film, like John's book, Soul of America is a hundred years of history, which is incredibly daunting. So when we went into it, we knew that the film was gonna be coming out right around the election. So I started looking at uh, issues that were really coming up at, in that moment, like what is going to be sort of on the docket? What are the moral issues that we're facing now? And I knew that I wanted to talk about what was going on at the border. I knew I wanted to talk about gender and, and voting rights and truth. And so that kind of drove the historical sections that we decided to focus on. And you know, it's interesting. Um, I know you mentioned John Meacham. Uh, I was reading an article and this stemmed out of an article that he had written about hatred in our country. And he said that the more he thought about it, the choice was not between uh, hatred and hope but it was between fear and hope um, and that fear drives a lot of hatred. Did you find that when you were making the movie? Oh yeah, I mean, and, and I think what's, what's great about, I mean, John couching it in the soul, sometimes you can say like, oh, that's a rhetorical device and it's such, it's like wishy-washy. That's what we came up against. Like what really is a soul? What, but for John, I think the soul was a, really about talking about like, what do we struggle with internally? And how is our internal struggles a reflection of our societal struggles, you know? And uh, I think that that's a really powerful framework because it then puts the responsibility on all of us. Like the decisions that we make in each of our lives can be reflected, you know, in our civic lives as well. 
And, um, and so fear, you know, like I do find that fear, especially specifically in the South, you know, in Texas, like you see a lot of fear, um, like the fear based mongering for uh, stuff around immigration and that makes it very emotional. And so I think John really uses history to kind of cut through that emotion, you know, so that we have a shared framework and we can talk about it in a more rational way. Well, I was going to ask, how did you decide on the history and those, quote, perennial forces that John Meacham mentions that the documentary covers? How did you decide what to focus on? Well, in the, in the book, the book was inspired by what was happening in August of 2017, the Charlottesville riots that took place there. And we saw just this you know, wash of white supremacy well up in the country again. And so um, John really wanted to look at what are these, what perennial forces exist in our lives. You could really see that sexism is part of it, racism is part of it, nativism is part of it, isolationism is part of it. And so those patterns that are sort of on a continuum create a framework for the book itself. So we took those patterns and we said like, how are we seeing them well up today? And um, I kind of saw a little bit of what happened to, you know, Hillary Clinton during the 2016 election and the way that gender played into how we were treating her during that election and the Me Too movement as something that we could reflect in what was like looking at the fact that just a hundred years ago, women had gotten the right to vote. And then what was happening on the border was so reflective of what happened with the Japanese American incarceration. And um, McCarthy in the book, John really talks about McCarthy as a sort of Trumpian figure, you know, and these attacks on truth. So that really drove that. And then we wanted to look at the 60s because you have to look at the 60s. You have to look at this ongoing struggle for civil rights and particularly the attack on voting rights today that is ongoing. Um, so that it was clear that that needed to be part of it as well. Well, I know you just mentioned voting rights, and I know that Congressman John Lewis is uh, appears in the film. What really resonated when, with you when you were interviewing um, John Meacham and, and looking at the clips of Congressman Lewis? Well, we... We, we were able to get, a, it took a long time to get our interview with John Lewis because he is so incredibly busy, but we actually, the day that we were interviewing him was the day that he and Nancy Pelosi announced the impeachment proceedings on the, on the floor. So it was crazy to be there in that moment, but um, that interview was incredibly special. He's a personal hero of mine. Um, you know, I'd spent my life learning about him. And I mean, this is one of these, those really incredibly special things about what I get to do in my life. It's go into these room, meet people like Dale and Don and George Takei. And, you know, just, I mean, I, it's what I love about what I do. Um, but the thing that hit me the most in that interview, he was recapping the story that he's told so many times in his life about Selma and what happened that day on the bridge. And, uh, and he started to cry, you know, and we had to, we cut the cameras and everybody in the room was sort of crying together and just the profound impact of that moment, you know, at that life, like sharing that quiet time with him and then getting to thank him, you know, for all of that work and everything that he had done is one of those moments I mean, it's making me tear up even now, just thinking about it. It's just one of those things I'll carry with me throughout my life, so. Oh, well, thanks so much, Katie. <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna turn to Congressman Dent and yeah. I'm gonna quote yourself. <laughs> ah. uh, you, you, you have said that this country needs to return to some sense of normalcy to the function of government and that this isn't about right or left. It's not about ideology to, to, to you. It's about right or wrong, stability versus instability, security versus insecurity, normal versus abnormal. What did, what did you mean by that? Well, as we were dealing, well, I, I guess, put it, if I put it in the context of the uh, presidential campaign, you know, I was being asked, you know, who am I going to support? And I, and I as a Republican, I supported Joe Biden for president. And people said, well, my goodness, but what about the judges or what about this policy or that policy? And I just tried to say, this really isn't about policy. It's never been about policy. It's been about just those things I mentioned, uh, normality versus abnormality, 
stability versus instability, uh, you know, uh, security versus insecurity. I mean, all sorts of things, uh, temperance versus intemperance. I mean, I could give you all sorts of examples. And I would always say to folks that, you know, particularly on the Republican side, uh, that if you are a, a center right uh, conservative or common sense conservative, you know, you believe in things like incrementalism, uh, you believe in measured statements, you know, temperance, discipline, stability, order. These are what we would call conservative uh, virtues or values. And I think broadly speaking, most Americans probably support those things too. They believe in discipline and stability and order as opposed to disorder and anarchy and chaos. So, but this is kind of like maybe the Edmund Burke view of the world uh, that this is what we, we ought to be about. And we kind of lost our way when, you know, the, at that time, the former president, uh, was you know talking about you know you know he he liked the uh, disruption you know I I understand disruption too but I don't like disruption for the sake of disruption <laughs> you know just the uh, or that's when we call it uh, chaos or anarchy and uh, and you know the, the name calling and the insults that we heard on a regular on a daily basis I said this is really not where we need to be we need to get back to something closer to normal where we can actually again begin debating actually uh, policy uh, and uh, you know and have real robust uh, debates. That's what I, I meant about it. And I should also point out too, that I think KD mentioned something about, you know, isolationism and protectionism and nativism. I've used those isms too, quite a bit uh, to describe what's going on. And, and, and candidly, or in my, when I first began my political career, I would have said that, you know, the isolationist elements and the protectionist elements really uh, probably more centered within the democratic party. Uh, there are nativist elements there too. Uh, now, um, th those elements are very strong in the Republican Party, uh, obviously, um, and, um, and we also have seen a, a form of nihilism, too, that has also uh, embedded itself, uh, and we see an ugly form of populism uh, that has also uh, in, in implanted itself, you know, in the, the American body politic, and, and particularly in the Republican Party at this uh, critical juncture in our history. Well, and I know Meacham has also talked about isolationism and nativism and denigration of the rule of law as appeals to our worst impulses. And what do you think are some of the recent issues or topics that you feel are fundamental to our democracy that should not be politicized? That should not be politicized. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that should not be politicized. Um, you know, how about wearing a mask? You know, <laughs> you know I mean, yeah. some very basic things that, you know, we politic. It seems like uh, uh, you know so many issues uh, become so politicized uh, un unnecessarily. Uh, it's it's really sad, or or even it may be an attack on the Capitol. And you know, we should be not. I mean, after 9/11, I think everybody came together and said, "Hey, this was out of completely, you know, abhorrent to all of us, and that we had a we we had we needed a a, a national consensus and a response, and we largely did." Um, for, for much of the time, but not all the time, obviously. Uh, same thing I could say after the, uh, the attacks on January the 6th, you know, we should have a, a, a response and everybody I think should be able to call out that type of extremism for what it is. It was, it was, it was, it was bent on, you know, o, o, you know uh, preventing and disrupting uh, the peaceful transfer of power uh, by uh, trying to stop the certification of the electoral college vote. I mean, I would think as Americans, you know, that really shouldn't be so political. It should just be a, a, one of those no brainer issues where there should be an immediate national consensus. Yeah, well, and, and I, I know you were in Congress for 13 years and, you, and we're kind of talking about things that have become political. Um, and I think over time, the data shows that um, there are increasing uh, percentages of party line votes where as like 20 or 30 years ago, Republicans voted the Republican angle, maybe 50 to 70% of the time, and it's up in the 90s now. And what have you seen over the course of your career uh, in terms of the way members of Congress um, vote and interact with each other and um, you know, those issues that are fundamental to, to our democracy that should not be politicized. What have you seen and what do you think are the causes for it and how do you think we should address it? Yeah, what we have seen happen is that the Congress has taken on like a, a, part, a parliamentarian voting pattern. Uh, you know, is if, you know, in, in the UK, for example, might be the best example, you know, you have the Tories and you have the Labour parties, the two dominant parties. Uh, and 
uh, you know, one's, you know, one's the governing, one's the, one's the party of the government, the other's the opposition, and they tend to vote, you know, pretty, pretty close uh, along party lines. That had been the case. Uh, and in America, our parties had been really more coalitions that maybe weren't completely coherent in, in terms of their makeup, you know, and, in in, you know, for years, you know, we had the Democratic Party that you had a uh, you know, Southern segregationists and Northeastern liberals and union members. And, and you had a diverse coalition of people. And you could say, you know, maybe it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense that they're, they're not sorted properly. Just the same thing on the Republican side. You had Northeastern Republicans who were more moderate or more liberal. Uh, you had uh, religious conservatives in certain parts of the country. Uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of small business farm farmers and uh, folks like that uh, throughout the industrial Midwest and the West. Uh, and so it was an interesting and, and suburban up, upscale voters made up that coalition. Uh, and, and again, maybe didn't make entire sense either. So what we've also seen too, and what has contributed to this type of parliamentary voting pattern where members are sticking very close to their parties, is what I would often refer to as those who are consider themselves as the uh, self-designated chiefs of the ideological purity police or, or the Republican purity police. And we've, you know, and who are they? Well, well, there are people in talk radio who would yell, you know, rhino or squish or bedwetter, you know, if you weren't, if you weren't doctrinaire enough, if you were not the one who was standing up there and, you know, you know, voting the party line, they would call you out. Then it got really interesting, you know, and the same thing starting to happen more on the Democratic side with the progressive wing that's becoming very empowered. Uh, and you see that with uh, some of the sitting members of the, uh, the House, you know, launching primaries or encouraging primaries against their fellow Democratic members who are considered uh, too moderate, who, those who are insufficiently committed to the progressive cause. So you see that happening. Um, and that is, a, I think, a very troublesome sign for the Democrats. They're, they're a few years behind the Republicans in this regard, but they're getting there. Uh, and so something, something to watch. Um, but that's really the issue right now. How do you, you know, people are afraid. Their political safety is seen as uh, attacking closer to their party's base. They see that any, any, any move towards compromise or consensus, uh, is, there's, there's, no, there's no political reward. So why do it? You know, if you're walking down the middle of the straight, you're more likely to get hit. I mean, that's the thinking. Stay closer to the side, of the, get, get closer to the shoulder. Uh, and that is a, a big part of the problem that we're facing in, in America right now, politically. Oh, well, Congressman, I love that analogy. Stick to the shoulder, you won't get hit. That, that is very yeah. apt analogy. And um, some, of them go into the, some of them go into the ditches. That's the problem. I mean, it's one thing to stay in the right true. lane and the left lane. It's quite another to be out in the ditch, you know, or, or even in the shoulder, I guess. But you want to, you want to, I mean, that's no, one of the great challenges. Absolutely. That, that, that is an apt analogy. Well, I wanted to turn to Mr. Manami. Um, in the soul of America, we saw that the Department of Justice abdicated their role to uphold the law and incarcerated Japanese Americans due to wartime hysteria. This was challenged in the Supreme Court in Korematsu where the court upheld the banishment and imprisonment of 120,000 Japanese Americans from West Coast states during World War II, despite uh, the Constitution. Um, and so I wanted you to talk a little bit about the lessons we should take away from that government action in Korematsu and how does it relate today? Well, a little bit of history. The, in the Korematsu case, which uh, challenged the incarceration by implication and the uh, banishment of 120,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry without notice of charges, without a trial, without the right to attorneys, uh, mostly from the West Coast states who were sentenced essentially to uh, indefinite confinement. My, my parents were put in horse stalls and then transported across the country to the swamp lands of Arkansas. So I have a personal interest in this. And later on when the Supreme Court accepted the big lies um, that were told about Japanese Americans and uh, they were promulgated by uh, West Coast farmer interests, uh, an agitated press, and there were a number of, uh, of uh, politicians who advocated. The most prominent, of course, was Earl Warren, who became a civil rights hero. Maybe, maybe we could just show that little clip. And my uh, ex-partner, Don Tamaki, is one of the speakers here who worked on the Coromont. When the war broke out, that gave a platform for politicians to build their careers. 
So Earl Warren ran for governor on the slogan that the Japs must go. A budding politician with great ambitions without principles is a dangerous combination because then you're going to do and say what you need to do and say just to get elected. The sentiment was to get rid of these Japs and Earl Warren sensing, of course, that this could propel him to a higher level or another office. The parallels were today that big lies were accepted then, that Japanese were dangerous, they were uh, disloyal, they had committed acts of espionage and sabotage. Uh, uh, people like Oral Warren said those things and they eventually made their way to the Supreme Court. But in the Supreme Court, ethical attorneys there discovered that what they were arguing in the Supreme Court was actually false, that they had just manufactured this evidence. And so the Supreme Court bought it because the danger that was presented in Korematsu was an uh, unfiltered acceptance of the military claims and the presidential claims that Japanese Americans were a danger. And uh, later, 40 years later, evidence was discovered that these were in fact big lies. And yet uh, the, the ethical attorneys who tried to alert the Supreme Court and the Solicitor General failed and the alteration, destruction, suppression of evidence remained hidden. And uh, I think we could also talk, show some of the clips that show some, what, what the evidence was of these big lies. So I wonder if we could run the clip of uh, Edward Ennis, who was a, one of those attorneys who tried to alert the Supreme Court of the ethical responsibilities. Yeah, let's just show that clip that you mentioned, Mr. Manami, about De uh, Ennis. Edward Ennis was in charge of preparing the government's brief to the Supreme Court when the Korematsu case came before it. Well, Ennis is looking to confirm and incorporate the facts of DeWitt, the Japanese Americans were engaging in espionage and sabotage. And so he begins to call up these reports thinking that he's going to incorporate this evidence within the government's brief. And in searching for the evidence, he finds the opposite that there is no evidence. Among the documents he found was the Office of Naval Intelligence report. They not only say that Japanese Americans pose no danger, but it actually recommends against this rounding up that happened. He writes to the Solicitor General of the United States, a guy by the name of Charles Fahey. The Solicitor General is the nation's chief representative to the United States Supreme Court. The Solicitor General speaks not just for the President, but also for the Congress of the United States. And Anna says, it occurs to me that if we don't disclose the contents of the Navy report to the court, that we are engaging in the suppression of evidence. Anna writes to the FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover and basically says, what about these reports by DeWitt of illicit signaling by Japanese Americans. And J. Edgar Hoover writes back, we've investigated every single claim of shorter ship radio transmissions, and we could find no evidence on which prosecution would lie. Ennis got in touch with James Lawrence Fly, who was the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, he prepared reports which they sent to Ennis, which concluded that there was no substance to any charge that Japanese Americans had committed acts of espionage or sabotage. We had that investigated by both the Federal Bureau of Investigation and by the Federal Communications Commission. And we got reports that there was no uh, records and their records were complete of any such uh, signaling. Efforts. Mr. Manami, oh, would you mind speaking up a little bit? I'm having a little bit of oh, trouble hearing you, but would, would, would you kind of speak to what we just saw in that clip? And I, I'll ask you something that's currently happening uh, with the uh, uh, 
incarceration of immigrants at the border. Can we learn lessons from the Korematsu case on that? Uh, yes, I, there's one additional piece of evidence. They had altered the official report that justified Japanese Americans to make it more palatable to the Supreme Court. And they actually burned the original copies which were in direct, direct contradiction to what they were arguing to the Supreme Court. So this misconduct then led to the overturning of convictions of Fred Korematsu, Gordon, uh, Hirabayashi, and Minyasui. What we saw in the Korematsu and the danger in the Supreme Court was the deference to the uh, military and the president. And so that checks and balances system uh, was diminished by that abdication of the responsibility. That deference and, uh, to the president was also seen recently when we, uh, there was a challenge to Trump versus Hawaii, the immigration ban against mostly Muslim nations. And that uh, immigration ban was really uh, uh, premised on religious uh, discrimination. And yet the court, while purporting to overturn Korematsu, which it really did not, uh, essentially reaffirmed the deference to the Supreme Court. We will not review what they're doing. And by doing so, I think compromised a democracy by compromising the whole checks and balances system that was devised by our leaders in the early days. Well, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna ask all the panelists just a, a, a straight question. Do you think that history is repeating itself? I'll start with KD. Katie, we'll go to Congressman Dent if, if she's not available. There she is. <clears throat> on mute. Go. <laughs> I just said yes. I said yes, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Once you begin to deeply get involved in, in this history and this learning, you see that we're on a continuum. And, and all of these unaddressed ills just kind of amplify and get worse as time goes on. And I think one of the things that John really says really effectively in his speaking and writing is that this is never a battle that we win. It's a battle we have to engage every single day. You know, And what I find so inspiring about history is looking and seeing these brave people who stand up who are often legal people, people, lawyers, judges who make decisions that go against their partisan beliefs or the prevailing cultural attitude. So um, history can also be hopeful in that way. Oh, Congressman? Yeah, I, I would agree that history, yeah, I would agree that history often repeats itself. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and you just referred to the, uh, or Dale just referred to the, uh, the so-called travel ban or Muslim ban. And at that time, you know, I remember very vividly, you know, we, we've seen these types of movements before, you know, we had the know nothing movement back in the 19th century. Uh, you know, we obviously had the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the horrible mistreatment of Japanese Americans during the Second World War, McCarthyism, you can go through a whole uh, period of uh, anti-immigrant uh, type sentiment. In fact, uh, I, I spoke out vigorously against that travel ban at the time uh, because of uh, the injustices I represented perhaps the, was what was likely the largest population of Syrian Americans, if any, in the country. Uh, and and I, I became alarmed because the day it happened, um, you know, I was being called by some families, it happened to be Christian, by the way, who were not refugees, and their families were being turned around. Uh, and they were, you know, they'd done the, the, the immigration process all the right way, you know, buying homes for the family. And, uh, and it was just really a horrible thing uh, uh, to witness. Uh, and they based that travel ban uh, on, on a, a law that was passed by Congress. It really had nothing to do with banning travel. Um, they, they identified seven countries and I was involved with a law that was actually enacted that had to do, frankly, with, uh, it had to do uh, uh, with people who had been to uh, Syria during the, uh, uh, during the ISIS battles uh, and that they returned to their home countries where there were citizens in Europe that they would have to go to the embassy for further screening. They couldn't just come in on a visa waiver that's all it was. It didn't stop anybody from traveling, but it was going to put an extra set of eyeballs on you in the event you were in Syria uh, at that time and a few other countries where there was, you know, where, where uh, there were the, uh, uh, the Islamist uh, uh, radicals were, you know, at, at war. Uh, so that's all it did. And they, they took that law and then, you know, really uh, bastardized it into this uh, travel ban. How about you, Mr. Manami? No question history repeats itself. And the old adage that 
those who uh, forget the lessons of history or don't learn the lessons are doomed to repeat it. I don't think that's quite true in this sense that people do learn the lessons. They know history, but they choose not to accept it and not to do anything about it because political expediency trumps uh, knowledge of history. What's important though, is to understand that history as John Meacham teaches, but also to do something about it. Because if you could learn the lessons and do something to make sure it doesn't repeat itself, I think that's critical because you could know history, but not do anything and you're nowhere. So I think ac action and activism is, is really important besides the knowledge of history. You know, there was a recent op-ed by Sherilyn Eiffel from NAACP Legal Defense Fund that appeared in the New York Times. And I think we'll put the link to that article in the chat. But um, she argues that lawyers enable Trump's worst abuses. And um, I think the thing that she, the point that she makes, and I think this started with the movie as well, is that there was the Charlottesville incident. There's specific incidents that if we let them go, they build upon each other. And, and one of the things she, Sherilyn Eiffel pointed out in the article was that during their confirmation hearings, over two dozen Trump administration nominees to the federal judiciary refused to say that the landmark school desegregation case Brown v. Board of Education was correctly decided, despite universal acceptance that Brown is fundamental to the rule of law itself. So she argues that just as the president, members of Congress and insurrectionists must be held accountable, the legal profession must take collective stock of why so many prominent legal institutions and leaders are supporting um, these kind of tendencies. Um, and so um, I'll ask you, um, uh, Congressman, what, what do you think of that, that argument? I think the answer is pretty simple and straightforward. A lot of these folks, not just lawyers, they want to be close to power and they want to wield power. Uh, and that's what drives them. And in, and I, you know, I know many people who went into the administration and, you know, had some serious misgivings. In fact, I counseled some not to go in, I, you know, because of the reputational damage that could likely occur. And there are others who I thought were smart to go in because they could prevent damage from happening. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, think people like uh, Jim Mattis and others like that, you know, who came in, I think, for the right reasons or, 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 or Tillerson or even Gary Cohn. Uh, but the the but but there are people out there, you know, who simply, you know, either believed in what was being said or they just wanted to uh, be close to the man wielding the power. That's very um, that's very intoxicating for some people and not just lawyers. Well, Mr. Manami, what about you? Uh, should lawyers be accountable? Oh, absolutely. I think the degradation of ethics, not just in the legal profession, but throughout this country, uh, abdication of principles uh, is, is distressing. Uh, what we've seen in the original Korematsu cases was an obvious uh, disrespect for both the rule of law and ethics in the profession. But we see that, I think, uh, among citizenry, and we see that in politicians, where self-interest trumps everything, and uh, no pun intended. But I think uh, it's important for us to find that kind of self, uh, excuse me, societal interest to understand and accept that we have a larger uh, mission here. And it's not just for yourself, it's for our whole country, it's for our whole society. So for lawyers who are leaders to disregard the ethics of their profession sends a message to everyone else. and. I think that's part of the reason we're having these problems today. And then Katie, how about you? I mean, lawyers are people, you know, it, it seems like a, a pattern that is happening countrywide, you know, and I think from my perspective, it's just, we haven't dealt with a lot of the deep problems around race mm -hmm. in this country. We, like since Brown v. Board of Education, we haven't made a concerted effort to get in and do any kind of truth and reconciliation process in any communities. And in 2016, there was, we gave people the space to begin to just, you know, like there were norms that you couldn't at least say things out loud and those norms are now gone. And now it's more accepted to just kind of be openly bigoted and, um, and that's sad. And I think that we need to address it. 
Well, I was going to ask you too, KD, how we receive and process news is vastly different today where breaking news can occur in a matter of seconds over Twitter or Facebook. So what role do you think social media plays in all of this? I mean, it's a different world. You know, I, I recently was talking to John about when, when we were looking at like Edward Murrow, what he was able to do in that period to stand up against the lies and Trump. It was a different media environment. Now, you know, like things that are definitely untrue, like it's it's just factually false that mm -hmm. Trump didn't, that, that there was any kind of like that Biden didn't win the election, you know, but there are media outlets that are willing to put that information out there to mm -hmm. create like a, like it's the same, you know? So I think um, then the bar, like on media makers, myself included, all of us, like whether or not it's picking up our phones and tweeting, like we all have an added impetus to check what we're putting out into the world, what that information is to check our sources. Like that's on every one of us because we're all media makers now. And, um, you know, and, it's, and it means it's difficult. It means there has to be like a wave of us saying truths and getting the truth out. It can't just be one person anymore. So I don't know if that answers the question, but. No, it does, it does. And I was gonna ask Congressman um, about the role of social media and it's kind of like a beast how do we tame this beast of social media that that spouts out so much disinformation? You know, I, I that's look, that's that's the big question that Congress is trying to wrestle with, and and there's no easy answer to it. I mean, I've often said social media is the place where people go to hate, uh, and they do in too many cases. And you know, and I'm I'm somewhat sympathetic to the companies uh, on the one hand. On the other, I feel like they have a much greater responsibility. Uh, you know, for a long time, you know, these social media companies and their platforms thought, you know, we're just a, we're just a neutral forum here, a neutral platform where people can express their views and, and a, kind of a laissez-faire approach. But, but we've discovered that that approach hasn't worked very well, and that that a lot of bile is being spread. Uh, and, and how do we how do we clean it up? And and I and I think that what it's done is it's given us all a great deal of respect, more respect uh, for more traditional media. Uh, which, and I, and this is where the problem with social media is there really no editors out there, you know, at least I'm, you know, I'm, I'm with CNN and, you know, you go with some other news source, whether you like them or not, you can say, look, at least I know when they put out some content, some news, that there's an editor who's looked at the thing and, and is fact checking. I know that because I write up ads for CNN and somebody looks at it before I put it out and they fact check and want to make sure that it's that what I'm saying is true and accurate. And, but that doesn't exist in social media. So that's why, these conspiracy theorists and others with radical ideas can throw out information uh, that is, uh, you know, very, uh, very dangerous in many respects. But a lot of folks looking at it, innocent consumers, of that information, you know, might not be very discriminating. And, uh, you know, and I, I don't know that the answer is, but I mean, the, the fact that the social media platforms, I think, are trying to crack down on bad content is a start. Now they're going to be criticized. Uh, for doing that. But again, it's their platforms, you know, and people get and they confuse the First Amendment. So many people, they say, well, you have a, well, that's the government stepping in and stopping you from speaking. It's, you know, you know, company X doesn't have a responsibility to share your view if they find it uh, would harm their, uh, harm their, their, their organization or their brand. And they can, they can silence it if they choose. So I think that uh, the fact that there's some self-enforcement going on, self-policing is, is, is to be encouraged and hopefully they'll get this right. Well, just last week, uh, we had a new attorney general confirmed, and he gave his first remarks to the um, men and women who work at the Department of Justice. And one of, he hearkened back to um, Attorney General Edward Levy, who was the first attorney general after Watergate. And one of the things that newly confirmed Attorney General Merrick Garland said uh, to people at the Department of Justice last week is the only way we can succeed and retain the trust of the American people is to adhere to the norms that have become part of the DNA of every justice employee. And Mr. Renami, I just wanted to ask you about um, the role of the Department of Justice in all of this. And I know that, that because of your work in the Korematsu case, the Department of Justice um, actually issued an unprecedented apology for misleading the court in that case. So um, how, what do you think about 
um, the, the task ahead of newly confirmed Attorney General Merrick Garland and the role of the Department of Justice? I think he's got a tall mountain to climb. I think that whole Department of Justice has been degraded to a terrible uh, degree to the point where the credibility has, has suffered greatly. And in the original Korematsu case, there's, you know, the Department of Justice was the, was the uh, center of all the misconduct and uh, unethical behavior. And what was refreshing was in 2011, Acting Attorney General, I mean, a Solicitor General Neil Katyal issued a remarkable confession of error, claiming or asserting that what they had argued in the original Korematsu, Hirabayashi, and Yasui cases were outright lies and they had breached their ethical duty. For him to criticize his own office uh, and was a beginning. It's a beginning of developing the credibility, the transparency that I think is required for that, uh, for that uh, Justice Department. I think Merrick Garland can bring that to us. And I think if we can hopefully bring back some of those folks who resigned because they would not do unethical uh, things, I think would be helpful to rebuild this Department of Justice. It was, you know, remarkable what it had done during the civil rights uh, movement and other, other times in our history. And for them to come back and be a leader in the law, act ethically and show as role models what you can do as a lawyer and what you should do, I think is a remarkable and important achievement that we have to accomplish. Well, and I know I mentioned that op-ed by Sherilyn Eiffel about the role of lawyers. And she said, um, this begins with a recognition that in a world in which raw power has come to transcend the unspoken code of civility and integrity among political lawyers, more is needed than the mere expectation that lawyers and government will behave honorably. And she said that, um, there needs to be a new, a new measure of independence uh, to the Department of Justice, and we need revision of rules. Do you, do you agree with that, Mr. Manami? Oh, ab absolutely. I, I think social pressure is important, but also it's both the carrot and the stick. I mean, the local bars uh, or state bars have been given complaints to uh, disbar some of the folks who are telling these big lies. And I think that's an important sign. I think the ABA, uh, plays an important role in this. Uh, they were once a uh, huge position as leaders of the lawyers of this country uh, is an important one. And for them to then speak out uh, against some of the unethical behavior, I think is really critical. So all these institutions have to stand up and have to speak out and have to try to bring people to uh, that code of ethics that I think is really rightly done and rightly uh, uh, promulgated for lawyers to keep the respect that they should achieve. Well, I want to ask all of you, um, uh, I'll start with the congressman since uh, you were chair of the Committee on Ethics. Um, what, what role do you think lawyers have going forward and how can lawyers really try to change the narrative and really um, start pressing a case for democratic ideals and integrity? Well, again, a great question for lawyers and it's a great question for anybody who's concerned about uh, our constitutional form of, of, of government. Um, you know, and I guess maybe, you know, again, I was chair of ethics. We, I was responsible for uh, trying to maintain standards of conduct. Not a fun or an easy thing to do. Nobody really wants to be head of internal affairs in the police department. That's essentially what the job is. You know, we had to deal with members who may have, uh, have crossed lines. And I guess what really surprised me so much during the last four years uh, during the Trump administration was that that standards of conduct that I knew that it had a House member done some of these some of these things uh, like calling a foreign head of government and asking them to intervene in your campaign right. and it were publicly revealed, well, you know, of course the Department of Justice would be investigating you. And, uh, or, you know, that's what always, or if you picked up a phone and called the head of the, uh, the county election or state elections and say the state of Georgia and said, hey, you know, I need a few votes for my race. Uh, you know, how about getting me, you know, 253 is what I need. You know, I mean, if that were revealed, of course, the attorney general of that state and perhaps the local uh, district attorney would be investigating you. And it seems that 
that that the standards have just dropped so much. I don't know. This is just a problem for lawyers. This is a problem for everybody. Uh, I mean that you know. I mean, I didn't like being in a position where I had to enforce standards, but somebody had to do it. And and you know, you try to be fair about it. Uh, but there are certain things to me that you know certainly did not in this last administration that did not pass the smell test. And certainly, had anybody else done them, they would have been in, in deep trouble. Probably would have been forced out of office and probably criminally prosecuted. And, you know, we're moving well beyond ethics in, that, in those cases. So, I mean, I guess that's what has has struck me that you know the public, so many people in our country become so tribalized, and politics has become so situational. Hey, if my guy does it, it's fine. If your guy does it, it's a human rights violation. I mean, that's the you know same thing. I mean, then then they just change they just change roles. You know and when the next administration is in. Um, and we're seeing that, I, I see this happen all the time because again, people don't, um, it, it's about loyalty to tribe more than it is about loyalty to a, you know, maybe to the constitution or to the rules or to certain standards. That's what, what it's, uh, I think it's all about. Well, I ask Katie too, I, and I think Congressman, your point is all take, well taken that it's not just lawyers, it's everyone, but I'll, I'll frame it in terms of the census panels about the role of lawyers. Katie, how about, how about your perception of that? Um, I actually, I was introduced to Kuhnhart films through the work of Brian Stevenson. I worked on a film about mass incarceration and was able to spend some time down at the Equal Justice Initiative and they may, were making a film of, of Brian at the time. And that's how this opportunity came to me. And I think when you begin to see the work of the Equal Justice Initiative and what Brian has been able to do to really change the narrative, you know, in our country around racial justice through the legal system, the work that Dale Minami has done, you know, around changing the narrative around what happened to Japanese Americans, you know, in that time in history, like these legal structures can move and shift culture and they have over time. So it's just, I mean, I think it is on all of us, but you know, legal work is so like, just ha is such a great place to begin. So because this is an audience of lawyers, you know, thank you. And I beg of you change the world for us <laughs> and I'll make a film about you. <laughs> 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 well, I'll, I'll ask uh, Mr. Manami a slightly different question. You've got, you were um, one of the reasons why we got that unprecedented apology from the Department of Justice in the Korematsu case. Um, do you think the Department of Justice has anything to apologize for in the recent years? Oh, we got a lot of things to apologize for. for exactly what Congressman Dent talked about, you know, in terms of all the misconduct that occurred that seems to be in a culture of uh, forgiving these kind of terrible uh, threats to democracy. Uh, and just a side note, I think what KD is doing is way more important than lawyers, because I think if you're reaching a larger group like you're doing with uh, the narrative that you're talking about, I honestly think that's very much more important in many ways. So... <laughs> I do think the Department of Justice is in bad, bad need of reform. Uh, I wish uh, Congressman Dent could uh, be a part of that now because I think his perspective of, um, you know, leniency or not leniency toward misconduct is really a critical one. I think we have to take these folks to task uh, and uh, bring this whole sense of ethics, sense of uh, principles, sense of justice to back together to this uh, organization. Uh, and I think President Biden is doing that. I, I wake up a little more relaxed every day now to, when I see that, you know, these immigrants are not going to be, you know, in prison forever. And, uh, and so I, I do think that uh, things are changed. But uh, as John Meacham says, and I think rightly so, it's on all of us. We all have to participate, whether as lawyers or as citizens, we need to be able to be active and do, do uh, the right thing. Well, I'll, I'll ask you, Mr. Manami, how can attorneys get involved to prevent history from repeating itself? You know, you can get involved as attorneys and citizens. I mean, I think you need to support those frontline lawyers who are fighting, you know, those 60 uh, uh, lawsuits brought by Trump to overturn the election, all of which were rejected because of the work of lawyers and judges who had a sense of principles and a sense of values. And so I think uh, lawyers can play a role, not just in the law, because we can't all be on the, those front lines fighting those fights, 
but you could support them. You could donate, you could uh, uh, volunteer. And as a citizen, you know, to be active with groups to support uh, politicians who are like, like Charlie Dent, who actually have a sense of uh, righteousness, a sense of principles. I think we need to turn this country not just legally around, it's gotta be turned around politically and in a deeper uh, sense, like KD says, you know, the soul of America has to be restored to a position where we could actually uh, see justice being carried out. Well, we've talked a lot about a lot of, um, uh, you know, horrible things that have been happening and, and race and racism and uh, isolationism and xenophobia and things that have happened over the years. But I think John Meacham would agree that there's reason to be hopeful. Uh, and I want to try to end on a more positive note. Uh, so I, I'll turn to um, uh, Kate. I'll start with Katie. Why do you think we should be hopeful at this pivotal moment in our history? I mean, I think one of the most wonderful things about what John does with his project is that he has looked at history to find those moments of hope because in amongst all of these hardships that has been the story of mankind, you know, these wonderful people have come together to create change, you know, and he says like with the election of Biden, we won a skirmish that, you know, we have a long journey ahead. It doesn't end, you know, every day we have to wake up and choose our better angels. Um, but I mean, I'm really hopeful about the new package, the relief package that was passed. There's some really mm -hmm. incredible legislation that is gonna help so many people. We're talking about economic inequality and racial justice in a way that we weren't 10 years ago. So I think that there's a lot of reasons to be hopeful. I've seen all the movements over the last decade really begin to change the conversation. And I think we're going towards a good place. You know, it's gonna take time, it's a journey, but you know, I'm, I'm really excited about this new generation of activists that are coming up and um, what the future holds. Mr. Manami, I'll ask you, um, should we have reason to be hopeful? I, I have to be hopeful. Otherwise <laughs> I wouldn't even be here right now because, because I have other things to do. Um, but, you know, I always recognize that civil rights or human rights are not a gift, they're challenges. And when I see what happened, especially in Georgia, when coalitions of people came together to fight voter suppression, which is happening again, of course, but which has inspired people to come together to come out and vote for the first time, uh, a lot of them. And, you know, Pennsylvania as well. We see these other uh, little signs of hope that I think if we could continue to build on and uh, have everybody see things like the soul of America, for example, I think it's inspiring and it teaches us that yeah, you can have uh, an impact. You can do something, even though you're an individual or a lawyer for that matter, uh, we can make a difference. How about you, Congressman? Yeah, I, I, I wanna be optimistic too, that I think that, you know, we were talking about, you know, the nativism and the isolationism and the protectionism. And, and, and I, I keep thinking that, I think most people deep in their, their, their guts know uh, that those, those are not attributes of a great nation and yeah. that, you know, this nation did not become great uh, by being um, xenophobic, uh, protectionist or isolationist. I often remind people, I said, look at our Declaration of Independence. I mean, in that declaration was, you know, we, we protested against the, the king's restraint of trade, you know, you know the, the, the British mercantile system that we were actually, our, our, our founders were fighting for open markets. You know, they wanted to, they wanted to trade. Um, you know, they, they weren't protectionists in that sense. Uh, and, you know, we have to, there's a lot that we can learn uh, from our history. Before the Second World War, we saw what happened uh, with isolationist and protectionist policies. Uh, you know, they, 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 I'm not gonna say that what caused the war, but they certainly were contributing factors uh, to the, that, that created an environment that led to, uh, to, to war. Uh, and uh, they pre they were pre precursors, and it, we you know we don't need to do repeat that. So I think that most people understand that uh, uh, where where we've been is not uh, not a healthy place uh, uh, psychologically or emotionally or or for the long term of the country. Right. Well, I, we're quickly running out of time. I would love to continue talking uh, for much more time, but I'll do a quick lightning round, a thirty second to each of you. Um, 
what do you want people and particularly lawyers to take away from our program today? I'll start with you, Mr. Manami, just a quick lightning round final thought. I hope people could be inspired to do something. Uh, it's so easy to be passive and just watch TV or social media to uh, go to the echo chamber of social media to find people that uh, agree with you. I, I think that keeping an open mind and listening to other folks and reaching out uh, in, in other ways as well. Uh, we've had a huge incidences of uh, anti-Asian violence sparked by some of the rhetoric, uh, that is racist rhetoric essentially. But I don't think that should uh, stop us from reaching out and trying to come together as a country. And I think if we see ourselves in a societal perspective in what uh, Congressman Dent says, you know, instead of isolationist, uh, and that includes uh, your, your uh, position as an individual that uh, reaching out to others and trying to trying to become more of a unified force for this country is is something that should inspire us to try to make this kind of change. Katie, one thing you want people to take away? Just not to lose hope. You know, the mm -hmm. pandemic has been a particularly hopeless time. I've struggled with it. You know, it's like it's been depressing. Yeah. You feel isolated. You know, this will end. There is joy, you know, just being hopeful and knowing that we can create change in our lives. Yeah. And Congressman, I'll give you the last word. <laughs> I'll, I'll simply say that uh, I think that the, the judiciary uh, has uh, dis distinguished itself over the last few years in many ways, as, as was, I think, mentioned earlier, uh, that lawyers and judges, in many cases, starting with John Roberts, you know, try to um, you know, you know uh, with all the election challenges and all sorts of other issues that came up, we were standing up when the executive branch and the legislative branch were falling short. And so I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that I actually, I, I took comfort in seeing these judges, regardless of which president appointed them, uh, standing up and making decisions based on the law and what they, they, they saw was, 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 was right. Uh, and I, so I was very encouraged. Uh, by that, you know, throughout m much of the last four years, and particularly since the election. Uh, so I think there's a, a lot of hope and, uh, and lawyers and judges uh, are playing a critical part in uh, the setting of standards and uh, helping us maintain some sense of uh, civil civility. Well, thank you all. This has been an amazing panel. I'm so grateful to all our panelists. You all are doing such critical work and we thank you for taking the time out of your schedule. The section of civil rights and social justice provides free web webinars like this and resources for legal professionals, but for anyone who's interested in these topics. And we hope this helps you. We hope you enjoyed the program today. And I would say, please, consider joining the American Bar Association. If you like this program, uh, you can help support our work in giving more programs like this. And you can join the section of civil rights and um, social responsibility at ambar backslash CRSJ. So thank you so much, everyone. And thanks to our panelists for addressing these important issues.